If you love movies and movie discussions, you've come to the right place. Who am I, you ask? I am The Wiz, and I'm here today with... Kim Shackman. Kim, Happy New Year. How are you doing today? Happy almost New Year. It's New Year's oh, Eve. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just get, get, <laughs> get specific on me. Fine. Good Happy Lord. New Year's Eve. Oh, God. You know what? Go fuck yourself. Good Lord. Maybe I will. Just kidding. <laughs> Ball drops. Happy New Year, ha! Huh? <laughs> Woohoo! No. That's um, a weird place to have a streamer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, before we get into it, mm-hmm. any New Year's goals or resolutions? I hate the word resolutions because oh, yeah. I feel like it's such bullshit. But... Yeah. Personally, uh, I want to keep losing weight. I, I purposely don't put my photos out there for reasons. Uh, in the beginning of last year, I was at like 375. I understand. I'm right there with you. I think I'm like 304 right now and I'm trying to lose the weight. Oh, yeah. But I mean, I don't know about you. Like, I'm a little taller, so it doesn't look that bad, but it's still there. No, you look good. Yeah, it's fine. But, you know, just to be healthier. Right. It's not even about how you look. It's how you feel. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I started at 375 last year. I dropped my weight down to 291 at the end of the year. Wow, so, that's really good. Uh, Yeah, yeah. So I want to keep that going. What um, about film-wise? I mean, I made a resolution last year to watch 100 films. I watched 133 this year. Wow, and uh, that you might be like, oh, that's a lot. But I've seen people that's pretty that I've, easy for you. I'll put it this way: there are people that I, I follow online who've watched four hundred this year. Wow, and that's where I'm like, bro, what? Do they not have a life? <laughs> well, okay. To be fair, a few of them are critics. So okay, so that's their job. Yeah. So yeah, th- that there's that. But there are ones who are not critics who basically. They watch a movie in the morning and they watch a movie at night wow. every day. Uh, to me, I'm like, I can't do that. I love movies. I love movies. That's a lot. But I can't do that. I'm going to do 100 movies a year again this year, but I also want to start watching film series, which is why I'm starting. Yes, you are mentioning that to me, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, so I am going to start by watching all the Bond films, which now that I think about it and go, wow, that was a really <laughs> tall order. How many are there? 25. Oh, my God. <laughs> but, like, in my mind, I'm like, I've seen most of them, so it's not going to be that bad. And then I realized, oh, wait, I watch them again to review them. Oh, shit. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I think I've only seen, like, two, maybe three. Yeah. Honestly, I did not care for the Bond films until the Craig films happened. And then I was like, wow, okay. The like Casino Royale is one of the best Bond films. It's probably one of the best action films ever made. That's what they say. Oh, yeah. it's fantastic. The way that the Bond films from Craig ended, I was so disappointed by. But but then I started looking. I got to watch the rest of them. So I got to a certain point and then just stopped. I was like, oh, I've seen most of them. Why not do it again? I will just get just do it for real this time. Do it and do all of them. I am. That's what I'm doing. And Nice. Yeah. yeah. It's exciting. Is it, though? (laughs) (laughs) I guess it is for you. It it has to be. (laughs) Better you than me. (laughs) Oh, God. So I can't convince you to watch, like, From Russia with Love? No. No. Okay. No Bond movies for me. I've seen a few. I'm good. Okay. Okay. That's fine. But I will be watching, we talked about, I would really like to see the Godfather series because I've never seen any of them. Good. So then that's what we'll probably do right after I'm done with the Bond films. Which is exciting. Yeah, it is exciting. It's fantastic. We're here to review the 1950 film Sunset Boulevard, starring Gloria Swanson, William Holden, and Eric von Stronheim, directed by Billy Wilder. This film is considered a beloved classic. It is on IMDb at 8.4 out of 10. It's on the AFI Best Films of All Time. It's on the BFI Sight and Sound Best Films of of all time is considered a Hollywood classic for a number of reasons. Kind of why I ended the year with this movie. Yes. What did you hear about this movie before we decide to review it? Nothing. I knew okay. nothing about it. I just 
from just from you, you just told me it was a black and white film. That's all I knew, which is kind of exciting. I sometimes like going into a movie not knowing anything. I am that way too, which is really hard to do at times because I yeah. am so into film. I kind of know what the film is about before I watch it usually. From what I've heard most about this film is one of the best noir films ever made. I don't know if you want to know what a noir film I is. I do not. Okay, I'm just so, going to ask you that. So a noir film is, there's a lot of tenets of noir films. It's usually black and white. It's usually a crime film, but on top of all that, it has distinct things in it that makes it noir. Uh, for example, there is the femme fatale that's in there, which is the woman who the main character is attracted to, but also is no good. Oh. There is the hard-bitten detective or hard-bitten male. But this that's is up my alley. Oh. <laughs> oh, man, I cannot wait for you to see some of the best noir films. But anyway, yeah, this is considered a, a Hollywood classic, and it's something that gets all sorts of honors whenever uh, best of lists come about. So uh, do you want to get into the review? Let's do it. Uh, let's get into the review of Sunset Boulevard, directed by Billy Wilder. So before we get into the review, let's get into the plot. Uh, a struggling screenwriter named Joe Gillis, played by William Holden, well, lucks into a uh, situation where he ends up at a mansion that mm -hmm. basically is run down that is owned by a once film star, Norma Desmond, played by yep. Gloria Swanson. And they develop a... And where is the mansion? It is on Sunset Boulevard. Ho -ho. Ding, ding, ding. Oh my God. <laughs> it's like it's all connected. <laughs> wow. <laughs> See what we did there? I, I'm glad one of us is paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> Like, oh yeah, it's on Sunset Boulevard. It's There's on. where the title comes into play. So oh, cool. Man. Anyways. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> so he ends up at the mansion. And basically gets roped into developing her screenplay that she wrote and fashioning it into a movie. As that happens, he gets wormed into a relationship with her. Kind of, no. sort of. Uh, no, I would say definitely in this movie he did, but like... But it almost seemed like a fake relationship, kind of. Wow, okay. Why don't we just get into the review then? Because <laughs> I've got a lot to say about this movie. So, uh, okay. Kim, why don't we start with your three points? First okay. point is? My second and third points are similar to yours, so let's start with my first one. Okay. Unfortunately, it's a little negative, but that's okay. God. I do feel like the film was a little bit lengthy. Okay. Uh, it's almost two hours, but... I do understand kind of why it needed to be because it had to tell all the different kind of sub stories to get you to the main plot, which is the relationship or fake relationship okay. <laughs> between Norma Desmond and Joe Gillis. So I kind of understand like why they had to, you know, go, go through the scenes that they did to get there to explain it. There were a few times within the film, like, I kind of, like, lost a little bit of interest. Like, I nodded off a little bit, to be honest with you. Like, okay. when Norma went to the studio to see, like, the producer to try to, like, get her film made, like, I was kind of like, okay, like, we get it. Like, you know, she's a washed up star or whatever. And, you know, I don't know. Like, I just got a little bit bored. I, th I think it was just a little too lengthy for me, but, okay. like, which was fine. Whatever. You know, like, some people can pay, like, really good attention to this film and, and be more interested than I was. But there were just some parts where I thought were kind of dragging. So I would under I understand that to a certain extent that you feel that way, because I, I don't think you're very much into Hollywood and how it's run and what the results are from people who are in that system. So yeah. I, I, whereas like you're really into film and like studios and production and all that. And I'm just kind of like, eh. I don't really care. Right. <laughs> so I found it interesting that they had uh, Cecil B. DeMille playing the director in this movie. I was actually kind of surprised by that and pleasantly surprised. The importance of that scene specifically or that sequences of scenes is it really shows exactly why Norma is the way she is. Or it, it, maybe not 100% the reason why, but it really solidifies the reasoning as to why Norma would think she is as important as she is, that she thinks she is. Because of how people treat her. Not even just how they treat her. In, in that sequence specifically, when she meets Cecil B. DeMille and goes through the entire sequence of basically Cecil trying to find out, why is she here? <laughs> it's like, right, well, right. why is she coming? Like, is this a visit or, or what? Whatever. It is basically because the system itself 
is based on lies. It is all based on obfuscation, which is basically what movies are to a certain extent. It's an obfuscation factory. The way that the, the scene plays out is interesting because it's not that she's crazy and delusional to, in this circumstance. Well, she is, but... <laughs> well, she, actually, she is. She No, she is delusional in thinking that she has a chance at this, but you still feel bad for her because... They're feeding into that delusion. Well, it, that's what I mean. Like, nobody's pointing out... Like, nobody's being honest with her, really. Absolutely nobody's being honest with her. No, absolutely. Yeah. You could say the reason why is because she was lied to throughout all of her most popular times, from when she was popular all the way down to where the movie is set now. Okay. Like, well, that makes a little bit more sense. Especially when you get down into the history of... Of how the studios treated not just actors but female actors, like the female, mm. like there is horrible stories about Judy Garland and what she went through. Oh yeah, I think I watched that film about her. I yeah, like yeah. she went through a ton. Like of hell. Terror. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Th but that's a lot of subtext that you'd have to really get into, and you'd have to be into on that. But I can understand where if you're not into those type of things, that scene specifically would be like, what's the point of this? Like, I think too, like I just don't really fully understand them because i haven't i don't know enough to know enough you know sure sure but it would be the film's job to actually provide that but i, I would agree it doesn't really provide that type of thing you just think oh this bitch is crazy and she thinks everyone loves her like oh. she's super full of herself like that's all i thought of absolutely like, she's just so full of herself like why are these people feeding into this but frankly i guess it sounds like that is just the business it, that is the business because if you have an actress who is full of herself or an actor who's full of himself and thinks everyone loves her or loves him what they're going to start thinking what the studio is going to say well if we just tell them oh they love you 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 got to do this you got to do that to make them happy oh i got to make my fans happy and you subjugate them you give them shitty salaries you put them in terrible movies just to make as much money as possible whether or not it actually helps the actor or not and right she is very much a result of that system but on top of that she does things in this movie that you you can't just say oh well it's because of the no she she is that bad of a person but this system actually feeds into that very much so, got it that makes sense it makes sense but the movie doesn't do that great of a job yeah it was like just kind of like hard for me to like really uh, i guess like feed into that during that scene and that's what made it me a little bit like bored with it i sure. guess yeah. and that's completely understandable yeah. my first point is it contains elements that shouldn't work together but work incredibly well i was interested to hear about what what the elements were for you like that's that's really cool like i'm like tell me more okay so noirs are not traditionally comedies this is a satirical comedic noir and these are three elements that do not work together at all usually you're talking about satire, a type of movie or story that is meant to poke fun at a certain thing, either comedically or dramatically to a extent that is maybe outlandish a little bit. You have noir, which is serious, hard-bitten, about crime, about bad people. And then you have romance in this movie in certain aspects. You have the psychological drama in this. All four of these disparate elements should not work together. That is true. And the thing that I think that is the thing that I would look at and go, it shouldn't work, is satire. But all the elements work because as satirical as the film is in certain spots, it still talks a certain truth about many different things. We just went through the example of how the studio system treats their actors. Right. We also have the psychological issues that happen throughout the film. We have the toxic relationship between William Holden's character and Gloria Swanson's character. And we have the romance develops within the film as well between Joe and uh, Schaefer and yeah and Betty Schaefer in the film all these elements mashed together would really need somebody who is very good at directing and keeping the tone a certain way and you have that in Billy Wilder a director who is I, I think more known for his comedies than I think something like this but Billy Wilder oh. is a fantastic director uh, if I recall correctly he did a movie that I reviewed this uh, last year called the apartment 
with Jack Lemmon, which is really good. He also <laughs> did Some Like It Hot. <laughs> like another. You've been telling me to see that movie forever. I really should watch it. Yes. That. And then uh, Sabrina, another movie that he did. That's. I also... think I've seen that. That was pretty good. You probably saw the remake. I don't know. With Harrison Ford and uh, Greg Kinnear? No, I don't think so because. Oh, when I was really girl. young, one of my um, friends was obsessed with, like, the older version. When I was really young. Like, I think I was, like, oh, yeah? 10. And she used to, like, watch it all the time. So I probably saw it when I was at her house. But that was a very long time ago. That's a good friend. Yeah, she was obsessed with, like, older <laughs> movies and black and white movies and stuff. And then you were thinking, oh, this fucking nerd. Good I'm lord. I'm just like, yeah. I'm just yeah. like, what is this? <laughs> I wouldn't want to be around. Some of them were enjoyable. You know? Oh, yeah. No, a lot of them are enjoyable. Absolutely. Yeah. This is a director that has a very diverse portfolio of movies. And you wouldn't think for someone who's good at romance and comedy can pull something off this diverse. And he pulls it off really well in this movie. Spectacularly well. Because, again, one element goes wrong and something falls apart in this. Yeah. And, and the, the satire part is a lot to do with Norma. These issues that are in the film are very real. They're very right, real right. issues, which we'll get into in our second points. But I think the disparate elements that should not blend together blend really well in this movie. And I was very surprised by that. Now, I agree with you on that point. Now, I won't say that it's it's amazing for it, but it just works. And it really needs a director that can pull that off. And Wilder directs it incredibly well. I will give him credit for that. Absolutely. So, Kim, what's your second point? The interesting dynamic and process of the mental abuse in this film. No physical abuse, right? But mental abuse between... There was a smack. Was there? There was a smack. Oh, there was one smack. I forgot yeah. about that. Okay. Yeah. For, so one smack, but that, I mean, yeah. yeah. So, men, But the majority of it is mental abuse between Norma Desmond and Joe Gillis. And then even like between the leading on of Schaefer by Gillis, like if you really think about it. Okay, um, explain this to me, because I, I looked at that on your, your thing, and I was like, yeah. wait a minute. <laughs> it's like, well, what mental abuse between these two? Like, Well, I kind of feel like Schaefer got led on, right? Because Gillis really couldn't make up his mind. And I do think the mental abuse of Norma played a huge part in that. Okay. But, like, if you love her, you love her. Like, stay with her. You know what I mean? Like, I just feel like she was kind of led on to believe that he was all hers, and he really wasn't. Okay. You know, so that's where I think the leading on came into play for her. And you feel really bad for her at the end, you know, even mm -hmm. though she's got a she's got another husband waiting in the wings. But and then, you know, Norma with the, the mental abuse of Gillis. But I think Gillis was just so confused and wrapped up in her that he just was like the hell with it. I'm just right. like this woman, like I'm part of this woman's life and I need to just show this to Schaefer. But yeah, Norma definitely did a number on him. Yeah. So this is going to go into my second point as well, which is the stark portrayal of an abusive relationship. Yeah, we have like so, similar points. There. Yeah, I, I want to point out a couple of things in regards to Schaefer being led on by Gillis. I get why you think that way. But let me just tell you what I saw on this. Like, I think he really loved her. Right. But then towards the end, like, well, if you love her, love her. If you don't, just tell her you don't instead of just being like, well, this is my life. And da da da. you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. When you're in an abusive and controlling relationship, like the one that Gillis was with Norma, you do see somebody that can get you out of it. You still feel guilt because I don't want this person to go through what I'm going through. So I don't want to have someone suffer like I am suffering. That would be selfish of me. That would be terrible of me to do that. Like as in bringing her into the fold with what he's going through? Not even just that or just getting her involved, period. A lot of controlling relationships rely on that person that is being controlled to basically have their life be that one specific person. And that's what I think that final scene showed in the film where he was trying to push her away, which is basically, can you provide this for me? Can you provide that for me? Even though you know Gillis was not happy. Like, he was right. miserable in, in that sequence as well. I think it was less of a, a mean of Gillis leading her on, because as soon as she left, he left, and he left to go to Ohio. Right. I think this was more or less the the guilt coming on throughout the entire film. And this is the thing that I... Uh, the, like, almost like he was using her as an scapegoat? Not even just that. Just the guilt of her going through Norma and what Norma does. 
Mm. Oh, yeah, because towards the end, she was, like, calling her and stuff. I forgot that part. Yeah. So I, I think that's what that sequence was. It, it wasn't mm. a... Um, so he's le- almost trying to protect her. Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, that makes a little bit more sense now. Well, when you haven't been in a... Oh, well, I guess I'm going to open up a little bit here. A lot of this movie reminded me of a previous relationship I had. And that's why I, I, the the psychological nature of this movie is what fascinated about me. Because when abusive relationship movies happen, nine times out of ten, the, abu- the abuser is a man, the abusee mm-hmm. is the woman... And what generally happens in these movies is the personality and the nature of that woman drains as the film goes on. But that's not what happens in this movie. Gillis stays the same personality-wise. He is as snarky, yeah. and he's as much of an arrogant prick as he usually is. But what this film shows is how much that Norma manipulates him. whether it Especially is- with finances. Not even just finances, even subtle things like honking the horn, limiting time from other people, to the 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 attempted suicide, which I kind of think never happened in this movie, even though there was a doctor involved. Right. I don't think that really happened. I think this was just another manipulation of her yeah. to actually keep him where he is. Film does a really good job of showing that the mental abuse that he goes through doesn't necessarily mean he becomes a meek kind of uh, ineffectual person. He's still who he is, but he's being greatly manipulated in this. Yeah, like I, I did, I did actually appreciate that. Like you said, from like a director standpoint, I was like in the writing, I was like, wow, like how is he not becoming meek? You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's just, yeah. Because the the one thing that in these types of stories that they do when the man is the one being abused is he gets demasculated constantly. Mm. He's put down terribly, which is not what's happening in this movie. A lot of abuse happens in the form of what's called love bombing. Do you know what that is? No. So love bombing is when someone showers all these compliments and gives you all these ro- like these rosy, lovely compliments. Oh, you're so great. You're so kind. I, you're too good for me. Stuff like that. And they constantly do that to butter you up. So then when they abuse the shit out of you, oh. you go into it. Going, well, you don't wait even a minute. realize he, it's happening. But he loves. But this person loves me. This person cares about me. He ne- he needs me. He he must be doing this for good reasons. It's a manipulation tactic. Mm. Th- this film shows that very well. And the love bombing also has to do with the finances. It also has to do with uh, the clothes and everything. But I think that's what this movie showed. Because just because you're being abused doesn't necessarily mean everything's being drained. Because they, when they do this with women being abused, what usually that's it is... That's what they always show. They, that's yeah. What they, yeah. They show that the, the woman either has no personality... Or that the personality is very much performative. Like, oh, hi, how are you? And you find out in the beginning and later on that she is being greatly abused by, right. the, by the man in this. This film shows that, no, the personality does stay the same, which is why it's really hard for people to really notice that someone is being abused like this. Until that person starts talking about what goes on in their family. Oh, yeah, my wife does this. Oh, my girlfriend does that. And someone has to point out to them, dude, that's fucked up. Are you sure? Right. <laughs> like, like, they think it's, like, the normal. Like, exactly. they think it's a positive thing, like you said, like, with the love bombing. And that's... Wow, I, maybe I had love bombing in my past. I didn't even realize it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. But, yeah, I, I think the movie does a fantastic job with this element of, yeah. the, of the story. Kim, your third point, which is a lot like my point. Go ahead. Similar, yeah. Excellent performance by Swanson, who was Norma Desmond. Oh, my God. She mm-hmm. was excellent. And I thought Holden was fine. Mm-hmm. I know that you felt that Holden was a great performance. I yes. thought it was good. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I just, I don't know who else would play that role, like, if needed, but... I don't know. I just Norma stood out to me and Swanson or whatever. And uh, like to be like that dramatic and then that um, to really show that you have like a mental illness. Like I feel like that's sometimes hard to do, especially around that time. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's why I really liked her performance. I agree with your your assessment on Swanson. I think her performance is a really good performance. Like, yeah, it, it is the right 
form of overacting because it's not right. overacting for emphasis. It's overacting to show the personality of the person. Right. And it's done subtly enough where you can look at it and go, she's really not overacting in this. She's actually perfectly she's just portraying the character. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> she's just perfectly capturing the character of this film. Right. What I disagree with your assessment on Holden is William Holden's performance is a difficult performance to actually uh, really wrangle down, I would say, because you still have to project this masculinity that Holden has while being treated the way he is. So he has to have the performance where Swanson's character is still very much attracted to him without being meek or without feeling lesser than. He plays that performance really well, both as the abusee and as somebody who is actually a very masculine person, which is why I think it really helps the story go along when he, it's going through him, because you, you don't go through the standard things that most abuse films go through, which is right. the... The person who's being abused, the start getting, they start cowering, they get really scared. In some cases, they're men, they're demasculated. If they're a woman, you know, they're being treated like a slave to a certain extent. Right. That's not happening in this movie. It, it shows because the, the character is still who he is, but he's just being manipulated. And the easy thing would be to make him more, more meek, make him more of a agreeable person, and he's just not that way. And he is not that way at all. And that is very important to do in this movie. And I think Holden plays it really well with this character specifically. That's how I think of it. Honestly. Yeah, I would agree with you too. I think too, like, again, like, I'd be like, well, I, I, if not him, I don't really know who else would be able to play it. So, I don't know. I think for me, like, personally, Swanson kind of didn't really like overpower him, but was just more noticeable. She is the performance of the film, like yeah. no doubt. Like I, I will give you that. And I think that's like where I where I'm coming off with that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Can we talk a little bit about about Eric von Stronheim? Who was that again? I forget. He played Max. Oh, <laughs> he was just like the typical like no emotional butler. Uh, yes, it's interesting seeing him in this role and how he portrays this role. I saw a film of uh, with him about a month ago called The Grand Illusion, okay. which he was very good in. It's a French movie from the I think the 30s. And he was really good in the film. It was really surprising seeing him in The Grand Illusion and how he portrayed that character and seeing him in this. Mm. And <laughs> You're right. See, I haven't seen him in anything else, so I have nothing to compare it to. Oh, yeah, I, I understand that. But yeah. I, I just like uh, just seeing him in this movie and then seeing him in The Grand Illusion was like, wow, that's a <laughs> that's, that's a step down. <laughs> um, It's different, I will say. Uh, I don't think it's a step down. I, I, I did like him as Max in this. I, I wasn't too enamored by his performance, but I think he played the character as well as he could in this the character himself i don't I know i just feel like it wouldn't have been that hard to play i think the film did not do a great job with that character mainly yeah. because of the revelation that you find towards the end of the film right that should have added something much more dynamic and it just went oh and guess what i'm like Oh, really? And then... And it the kind of fell flat. Like, oh, it did. Like, but it fell flat because it did nothing with it. But, like, uh, after that revelation, it's like, oh, that's interesting. And then nothing happens with it. Uh, and I'm uh, like, I mean, it, like, kind of makes sense in a way. But yeah, at the same time, I'm just like, okay, who cares? Like, <laughs> It makes sense because it shows the cycle of abuse that Norma right. Full circle. puts all, all his me her men through. So, right. yeah, I, I do see that. But there should be much more of a psychological bent with that character, and it's just not there. All right, Kim, so what, who do you recommend this for? Um, those that enjoy older black and white films. I thought it was pretty cool. I liked, the, I liked that it was in black and white and how it was shot. I thought it was pretty cool. And then, like, murder mystery type films. And now that you've introduced me to the word noir... That mm -hmm. makes sense. Like, if you like noir, noir films, a.k.a. I, I think of it as a little bit of, like, a murder mystery. So, yeah, that's who I recommend for. Okay. And who do you not recommend it for? Children. Children. Sh I don't think children should watch this film. And then if suicide is a trigger for you. Okay. 
Yeah, um, I don't think children these days will look at this and go, what's the big deal? <laughs> They'll be like, uh, okay, so a guy dies in the pool. All right. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, I think, too, like, it's not recommended because I just don't think they'd enjoy it, right? Yeah, like, they'd absolutely. They'd be like, what is this? I don't care about it, you know? Yeah, it, it's got, uh, I think, the, the the themes are a little too complex for kids, I would say. So, yeah. Sure, that, I see that. I recommend this for fans of psychological movies. This film does a great job of showing... Uh, how someone who is an, an abusee uh, in a toxic relationship and, and how they react to things and how the abuser manipulates that person, I think that does it's a really good job on that. Mm -hmm. And I also recommend this for people if you're fans of old Hollywood. I mean, not just old Hollywood films, old Hollywood in general. There like is in a, general, yeah, because yeah. I'm not really, I know nothing about it, you know. So I think, again, that's why I was a little, there were some points where I was a little kind of bored with, but I think you're absolutely right if you're, you enjoy that, and you you know a lot of information about it. I think you'd enjoy the film. Yeah, there's like a whole cottage industry of people who just love not just old Hollywood films, but like to learn stories about old Hollywood. And there are fascinating yeah. stories. There are fascinating stories about old Hollywood. So mm -hmm. I don't blame them on that. Who do I not recommend this for? I do not recommend this if you are triggered by suicide or abusive relationships. Let me tell you something. <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, I had a little bit of a hard time with this movie. Not not Did that you? not that it was like, oh, I can't watch this. It was like, oh boy, this is familiar. <laughs> yeah, like, I was like, oh, like this boy. is bringing up some past memories. I oh. don't really want to revisit. <laughs> yeah, if you are still in the thick of healing from that, yeah, maybe not want to go through this movie real real quick. And then if you're not a fan of noir films, I mean, which you, makes sense if you. You'd know if you are and you're not. I'd say this is mostly a noir film, but the other elements in it make it very different from noir films. But I think for the most part, it stays on that end. Hmm. Overall, Kim, do you recommend Sunset Boulevard? I do. Okay. I would recommend it to, to the masses. Uh, the, to, to the people? To the people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to all the people. <laughs> I would, yeah. Okay. I mean, would I watch it again? Eh. Probably not, but I didn't think it was a terrible movie, but I also didn't. We were kind of talking about this at the beginning. Like, I guess I don't really understand why it's like one of the best movies. Like, I wouldn't go that far overall. Yeah, I'd recommend it. I recommend this, too. I like it as well. I, I kind of agree with you. I don't understand. I, I do understand why a lot of uh, uh, publications say this is one of the best movies of all time. It's because these people are very entrenched in that society and are obsessed with Hollywood and old Hollywood and the way Hollywood is right now. But I think that a, has a lot to do with it because it, it shows a lot of depth in that circumstance as well. I think another thing that makes this film stand out to a lot of people is this type of film where it's an abuser, abusee type of film. The roles are reversed in this because the abuser is a woman and the abusee is a man. And right. that really strikes people differently when they see that in, in certain circumstances. Because we all know that when we talk about domestic abuse, domestic violence, partner abuse, stuff like that, the vast majority of people talk about it as the female getting abused the and victim, the male yeah. being the abuser. Right. Which... I get there are statistics that say that it's more than likely to be that case, but there are plenty of circumstances where it is the exact opposite. And so maybe that's why it's so popular because there aren't many films out there like that. Like, I guess I just didn't understand why it was so like beloved, but not just that, but also it's a window into old Hollywood and how it treats its mm -hmm. actors. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. What happens to those actors after their light fades, essentially. Mm. So I think that's why it be, it's become so beloved. And there's going to be people who are going to be in the comments going, well, no, actually, it's just a, it's a great movie, and you plebs just don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> Which hey, would, to each their own. Exactly. I I, okay, <laughs> you bud. do you, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you, man. I, I, I'm proud Whatever you. makes you happy. Like, yeah. You think this is great. I yeah. just personally don't. I think it's a good movie. I don't think it's the best movie. I think it's a good movie, and I will watch it again at some point. I just, I'm with you. I don't exactly understand why it's beloved the way it is. Right. I do see certain things in the movie where it would take somebody like a Billy Wilder to pull this off, and he pulled it off. 
Like I, mm-hmm. I definitely see that. So overall, we both recommend Sunset Boulevard. We just aren't huge fans of it, essentially. Right, right, right. Right. So there we go. Now, if you want my full review on this movie, you can go to my website at, at IamTheWiz.com. You'll have my full written review right on the site, along with a link to the video that has this review that you've just listened to. All right, Kim. So for next time, let's go into what we're watching and what I'm reviewing throughout the week. Sure. Uh, Monday, I'm going to do the top 10 first watches of 2023. Check that out. The uh, Explain that to me. What is it? So all the movies that I watched for the first time this year, oh. these are the top 10 of those films. A lot of critics, when they do top 10 films, it's top 10 of the year of films that came out. Since I'm not doing that, I was like, okay, all the films that I watched for the first time this year, I'm going to do a top 10 list. So you must have so many lists. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. If you go, if you go on list my letter... After list. There's like about a hundred on my letterboxed. Oh my god! These are my top ten first watches because, like, honestly, if I were to just put all the movies I reviewed this year, it would probably be like, oh, number one's Notting Hill, number two is Hero, number three, yeah. <laughs> True Grit. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody okay. knows. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I was like, okay, first watches only. That's that's how I did it this year. That's so, cool. I like okay. that. Our theme this week is movies. From years that end in four in celebration of the beginning of 2024. Tuesday, I'm going to review the conversation directed by Francis Ford Coppola. Thursday, I am starting the trek into all the Bond films. And I'm going to start that with <laughs> Dr. Godspeed. <Dr>. Speed. <laughs> Godspeed, sir. <laughs> And I'm going to start with the very first Bond film, that is Dr. No. Saturday, Kim, you chose the film that we're going to watch for movies from years that end in four. What are we watching? We're watching The Theory of Everything? Yes, The Theory of Everything, the biopic about Stephen Hawkins. This is a film that won a couple of Oscars at the year it came out. It won Best Actor for Eddie Redmayne. Something that is kind of contentious nowadays, I mean, there was a there was a whole group of people back then who were like, "Oh, Eddie Redmayne is just fantastic," and now it's like, "Oh man, that guy's overrated." <laughs> <It's> like, oh <laughs> shit! <laughs> It'll be interesting watching that film again. I watched it in 2015, I think, and it came out in 2014. Hence, right. the fours at the end. Yes, that's what we're doing. I've never seen it, so I'm pretty excited to watch. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be interested in seeing what you think of this film and specifically what you think of Eddie Redmayne in this movie. What I, is he in? I don't even know. Let me he's know. in The Danish Girl. He was in Le, Les Miserables. He was in... Um, oh, Les Mis. That's what I know yes. him from. Yes, that will be an interesting one. So tune in next time. We're, uh, Monday, I talk about my top 10 first watches of 2023. Tuesday, I review The Conversation, directed by Francis Ford Coppola. Thursday, we go through MI6, and we review Dr. No, and Saturday, me and Kim review The Theory of Everything. I am The Wiz. And I am Kim Shackman. Talk to you next time. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy Bye-bye. New Year's Eve. Happy New Year's <laughs> Eve. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gotta be so exact. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Bye.